This is Brother Peter Diamond here with David Moore, and we were going to be having a discussion slash debate about the issue of justification by faith alone. He believes in justification by faith alone and eternal security. I do not, and so we we're going to be discussing that issue, and um, I was recording that now. So I don't know if you wanted to begin. Now, this was just a test to see how the, how the recording was going to work, or...? Uh, no, actually, I started it. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. Um, could we begin with like an opening statement, kind of like in you know, like in court, like opening arguments or something? Just nothing too long, but you know, you can have however much time I have, of course. Okay. I'm, I'm not hung up on the time, but yeah, we can begin with an opening statement, uh, just an overview kind of a thing, and then get into whatever after that. Okay. Okay. Um, you want to go first, or? You, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, by way of opening statement, I wanted to, one, make a disclaimer for all the listeners and everything else, but uh, if, you know, obviously we're on different sides of the fence as far as these issues go, and in discussion of any doctrine, if I use any, you know, colorful terms like if I say something is, uh, something is absurd or something is uh, false or deceptive or monstrous or anything like that, I just want the listeners to know that that's not a personal, I'm not casting aspersions on Brother Peter, I don't think he's you know, a liar or a bad man or anything like that. I, I respect him quite a bit. It's just, it's the issues, you know. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood. So if I say any of those things, it's not a personal attack, so nobody has to be offended for anybody else. It's just uh, I'm uh, quite uh, quite pleased to be here and that he's taken the time to talk to me. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. And for opening, I just want to say that uh, the Bible, there are certain issues about which the Bible appears to make conflicting statements. And I think anybody who's read it knows that. There are things where it sounds like at one point it's saying something, and at some point it sounds like it's saying the opposite. We know that these uh, apparent contradictions are just that. They're apparent. They're nothing, uh, the Bible is in perfect harmony with itself. And the way to resolve the uh, uh, apparent conflicts is to look at the Scriptures in light of the more, uh, the more definitive statements or... Uh, what is that? More definitive statements or... Uh, an overarching principle, or something that's uh, that's firmly established, which cannot uh, withstand you know uh, any number of verses that seem to oppose it. Um, failure to do that, I think, leads to all kinds of trouble and all kinds of uh, aberrant teachings. Like the rankest example, of course, would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. They take a statement Jesus made about his father being greater than him, and in response to being called good teacher, he says, uh, "Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God." And they run with that, and all of a sudden they have busted him down from God to just being a creation. And in spite of the, you know, how ridiculous this is in light of the rest of the scriptures, where he is worshipped, he is exalted, he's called God, equal with God, and uh, so forth. And, of course, a much more reasonable example of that would be Calvinists. And I'm assuming that unless Brother Peter is the only Catholic Calvinist in the world, that he's not a Calvinist, and neither am I. So the Calvinists have a much stronger case. And that's why I wanted to make an opening statement, because this seems off-topic, but it isn't really. I'm getting, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, they have a much stronger case. They can put down Scripture after Scripture that really seems to show God unconditionally electing people, like Romans 9, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. And uh, before the children were born, Jacob and Esau, uh, he, uh, he called the one uh, that his purpose according to election might stand, it makes it sound as if he simply, as they uh, affirm, grabs a certain number of people, eeny, meeny, miny, mo style, and uh, reprobates the rest and doesn't even give them a chance, even though it appears that he's sincerely offering salvation to all. Now, neither of us, I think, believe that, and, uh, because the, what they will not grant God that resolves this issue, because he does say, look to me all the ends of the earth and be saved. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, God commands all men everywhere to repent. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I believe that as it's written. The other scriptures, I think, have to be seen in light of God's foreknowledge, which, as uh, Brother Peter put it beautifully once in one of his uh, recordings, and it, it, it has never been said better, most men are of bad will, and God leaves them in darkness. I think that's as good as it could have ever been said. And the Calvinists simply will not grant God foreknowledge, although they pretend to be defending his sovereignty all the time, as if if he granted man free will, then he wouldn't be sovereign, which is preposterous, of course. That case, as strong as it seems, doesn't stand up. And uh, when it comes to justification by faith plus works and eternal insecurity, 
Uh, Brother Peter has a very fascinating audio. I, I recommend it, actually, 90 minutes long, all scripture, no popes, no councils, just all scripture, that really seems to make a rock-solid case for that. And I don't, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight, I'm sure. I don't think it does. Uh, I think in spite of what appears uh, uh, to be a solid case that uh, one can lose one's salvation uh, once having attained it, and as we'll you know, see as we go into the scriptures, I believe if it were not possible to be assured of salvation, the Bible wouldn't uh, make such a, uh, an offer or make such a, a statement to anybody, and I believe it does. So that's, that's where we'll go from here. We'll look at the different scriptures on that issue and uh, on justification by faith. Is it by faith alone or by faith plus works? And can you lose your salvation once you have it? And that'll be our, our first topic tonight. Okay. Take it away, Brother Peter. Okay. He had about five minutes, so. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, basically, I would begin by saying that as it's covered in our material, there are all kinds of passages in Scripture which clearly indicate that justified believers can lose their salvation, that whether God gives someone salvation is dependent upon his responsiveness to grace and the things that he does. And I'm going to be covering a lot of those uh, passages. And when you look at all of this evidence in totality, it's simply overwhelming. And it should be accepted by any person who's operating honestly. But you brought up the point about Romans 9 and some of the other passages, and that's one of the things that I cover in my book and in my audio, that there are basically three um, aspects of misinterpretation that people make on this issue. They will quote certain passages where the Bible says that whoever believes in Jesus will be saved. But if you look at those passages, in basically every case, in the context or in the extended context, it clearly indicates that believing in Jesus unto salvation involves, presupposes, doing what he says must be done. And that's shown in, in many examples. Uh, the other classic case of misinterpretation that is easily refuted if a, and should be seen by a person if a person is looking at things honestly are the few passages that are cited about being justified apart from works of the law, okay? When that's clearly indicating, in context, the works of the old law. And so, for instance, in Romans 3.28, when it says that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, many Protestants, maybe yourself, interpret that to mean that men are justified by faith without any consideration of any human deed. And that is clearly ridiculous because in Romans 3.1, it introduces the topic of circumcision. And throughout the book of Romans, it's all about how the Gentiles cannot be excluded simply because they are outside the law of Moses. And so the context is without any question referring to how God can grant you salvation through the faith of Christ apart from any limitation to the works of the Old Testament system. And so it's just a gross misinterpretation when people quote those few passages and say, well, this you know, excludes any consideration of human deeds at all. And then there are a few other passages which people will cite, like Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you compare that passage to Titus 3.10, you can see the language is almost exactly the same in certain passages. And it's referring to the first grace of justification, the first justification, which is unmerited, okay, that you can put yourself in a position to receive it, but only the blood of Christ can actually take away your sins. It's almost like you can step into the batter's box, you can pick up the bat, you can put the gloves on, the helmet, etc., but only God can hit the ball. And so when it's emphasizing that point about how it's only God's power that can actually take away your sin through his sacrifice, people misunderstand that. And those are the three principal areas of misinterpretation. Meanwhile, people focus on those, Protestants, and they ignore hosts of passages which clearly indicate that man is not justified by faith alone. For instance, in sacred scripture, it says very clearly in James chapter 2 that you are justified by works and not by faith alone. Uh, the whole parables of Jesus, many of them make no sense whatsoever in a faith alone theology where he talks about in Matthew 5 how you must cut off your hand or pluck out your eye lest it 
you know, be an occasion for you to be doing things that will cast you into hell. Uh, in Matthew 7, he says, Not all who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who doeth the will of my Father. Um, in every single passage about judgment, it refers to being judged on the basis of your works. Every single one. In the one place in sacred scripture, in Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus is directly asked, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? In response to that question, Jesus doesn't say, well, just believe, or you're mistaken. You don't have to do any good things to attain eternal life. No, he actually says, you must keep the commandments, Matthew 19:16 through 17. So it's clear. And then we have St. Paul. I, I have about, well, my, my opening statement, I'll just finish by pointing out that St. Saint, Saint Paul clearly indicates that certain sins will exclude you from salvation. And he also indicates, and he also indicates in 1 Corinthians, uh, he talks about how salvation involves a race which we must run to the end. And he says that I fear when I've preached to others that I myself should become a castaway. And actually the word he uses there in the Greek is adokimos. It's the same word which is used in numerous other passages in the New Testament to indicate lost souls, mortal sins, mortal sinners, and apostates. So St. Paul himself clearly says that he could become a reprobate or an apostate, indicating that man can lose his salvation. So I, I've had, had my time for the opening statement. If you wanted to respond, you could. Um, no, no, we, um, we'll probably be just, uh, since we don't have like a moderator or anything, we'll probably be just kind of free form going back okay. and forth. Like, so I'm, not, I'm not concerned about time. You know, I'll think of something and I'll say, okay, well, what do you think about this? More okay, sure. That's um, fine. I, I think that, uh, you know, and those all seem very compelling, as I said. This is, this is by far your best case. I mean, this is, a, this is and, you know, I, it really does appear to say that. I, I hesitate to believe it. I mean, I, I, I hold back from believing it because of what else you see in Scripture. The ant, uh, from the beginning of all the epistles and everything, and, and even in the Gospels, there's this antithetical thinking. There's us and them. It is constantly drawn, the line between us and them, and, there really isn't any talk about uh, the, the saints are never described as sinners. The sinners and people of the world and those who dwell on the earth, like in Revelation, are never described as, uh, I mean, they're never described in the same light. There's just this dividing line. Now, it says in many passages not to be partaken, to not partake in them of their deeds and all that. But when Paul is facing his death and when Peter is facing his, his death and Stephen, of course, we don't see anybody concerned about... Uh, their souls. I mean, I guess they know. Uh, you, you would say, of course, in, in the Catholic view, that they they know they're going to be justified. They know they don't have any sins, or they've confessed, or whatever. But I just there just doesn't seem to be that. I've well, there I actually, there are certain passages. If I may just respond to that, like yeah, like, uh, well, like the one you just used with the uh, the castaway. Well, not only that, but specifically, you were mentioning the concept of fear. Well, like in Acts chapter five, uh, after. Peter struck Ananias and Sapphira dead by the power of God. And it says in Acts 5.11, And there came great fear upon the whole church and upon all these that heard these things. And uh, it goes on to say, I believe in that same chapter, that they continued walking in the service of the Lord and in the fear of the Lord. Okay, and so, and in St. Paul says in Philippians 2.12 or 2.13, depending on the Bible you have, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. And so this idea that's, this is, I've, you know, Protestants bring this up. Well, what you're saying is opposed to the gracious comfort and the, that, you know, the gospel should afford us. Well, actually, no, that's just a selective uh, application of certain passages. There are clearly passages which indicate that you must fear for your salvation. And that's why a lot of these uh, letters are written to the believers. And he's warning them, you know, you better not do certain things. And so he's clearly inculcating a certain fear. Obviously, within that context, there can be a hope and a comfort if a person is walking correctly. But the idea that it absolutely excludes any concern or fear would not be correct. 
I've, I've had, uh, I've had uh, other uh, Catholics ask me that before. They say, well, why do you fear God? Because I, I, anybody who doesn't fear God, I think, is just a fool, frankly. You know? Any, uh, why do you fear God if you feel certain that he has accepted you and you are in the kingdom of light and you are you know, made meet to be partaker with the saints in light and everything, and he's not going to send you to hell, basically, no matter what you do, which I, I also like to address this caricatured idea that many uh, uh, Catholics have, that, which unfortunately is true in many cases, of people who profess to be Christians like to believe in eternal security and faith alone and everything because they don't want to live holy lives, because they're not really interested in that. They want to have, you know, they look and they say, well, you know, I'm expected to sin because that's what I am, a sinner and everything, and they, they figure that grace covers it all. I, I think that, as, uh, you know, as is written, that a man who has this hope in him purifies himself. I mean, you're really supposed to, like, as you said, work at your salvation with fear and trembling. Not that I fear God is going to send me to hell, but he's, he's fearful anyway. I mean, he can do all kinds of things to you. He's just fearsome, even if you know he's accepted you. I mean, we fear a God who we're also supposed to call Daddy. I mean, there is that dichotomy there. I get very upset when I hear see people wearing shirts that said, Jesus is my homeboy and Jesus is my BFF, best friend forever. And anybody who thinks like that, you know, Jesus is not that kind of friend. You know, there's no other friend you have that says, obey my commands. I mean, he's God. He's, he's frightening. Everybody was frightened of him on earth whenever he did his, his uh, manifested his glory. So I do fear God, even though I, I feel he has accepted me. And, uh, but that doesn't prevent me from wanting to and endeavoring to live a holy life. You were talking to the other uh, uh, Protestant guy, Jerry, I think his name was, about this issue. And he was saying something, and it sounded like he was saying, oh, well, we sin all the time. And you said, no, not mortally. And I, I would have to agree with that. If I believed in mortal sins, I honestly couldn't remember the last time I committed one because I dread sin. I absolutely avoid it at all costs, you know, uh, because, I, because I fear God, because I love God, because I'm, so, I'm grateful for uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so well, you know, like, yeah. I, I, I would say that a lot of Protestants may define mortal sin in a very limited sense. Like, I've heard some Protestants who believe in justification by faith alone, like certain prominent Protestants, um, and their goal is to try to, to prove that everyone is such a wicked sinner, and they say, have you lusted after someone, like Kirk Cameron and these guys? Yeah. And I guess their point is that everyone does that. Okay, and, and so I think that that's a big problem, obviously, with a lot of... Uh, Protestants, etc., they do not believe that these things involve mortal sins, such as Jesus indicates in Matthew 5, that consenting to impure thoughts, looking at impure things, okay, certain other things, they don't qualify as mortal sins, which actually are. So people have sometimes a very deficient view of what constitutes a mortal sin. But you were talking about how it's a caricature to say that, you know, Protestants embrace this faith alone thing because they, you know, want to continue sinning. Well, it really was born, I mean, whether one wants to admit it or not, from Martin Luther, yeah. who who basically devised that one could make a strong argument for the very reason that he wanted to justify committing sins. But also, John chapter 3 talks about uh, how people don't come to Jesus lest their works be reproved. And right. so we see an indication there that people do not embrace the full truth of Christ because they don't want to change, obviously. And so I think that I believe that that is a big reason. I believe that's the main reason most people adopt this false theology. I would actually agree with you. I, 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 I guess basically I'm just saying that everybody's not like that. <laughs> I mean, we're not all like that. There are those of us out there who are as committed to holiness as if our very souls were going to be, were hanging in the balance every day, even though we don't believe they are, you know. Uh, so that, that everybody isn't like that. Unfortunately, that is true. There are people who really, you know, just don't really want to give Jesus the time of day, but they consider themselves Christians. Well, uh, it, speaking of... Sorry, go ahead. Ahead. I was just going to say that I've asked uh, certain other Protestants and... They haven't even been able to come up to, with any uh, semblance of a response to, like, how would you explain a passage such as Ephesians chapter 5, 5 through 8, which lists certain things which will exclude a person from heaven, okay, covetous man, unclean, whoremonger, and the Bible says to the believers, okay, let no man deceive you with vain words, uh, these things will exclude you from the kingdom of God. And it says, Be not therefore partakers with them. 
for you were sometimes darkness, but now light in the Lord. So it's talking about justified believers and things which will exclude people from heaven, actions. And it says, be not partakers with them, indicating, obviously, that the justified believer can be a partaker with those who are excluded. Yeah, I, um, I know this isn't going to sit well, but I, I actually do. I'm, I'm surprised you, you never encountered anyone who had like an attempt of, a, of a, an explanation for that or an understanding of that. I've always had a position on that that uh, just comes readily to mind. I didn't have to really go digging for it. Um, when it says, uh, when it lists sins that people who do these kinds of things uh, are excluded, will not inherit the kingdom of God, as I've told you before, this type of person will not, you know, the people who do this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That, I think, is pretty much lines up with uh, quite a few scriptures that I have here that I was going to talk about tonight, because I think that it doesn't say, it says people who do these things, I believe it means people whose lives are characterized by doing these things um, uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, uh, in fact, it even says here in that same Ephesians 5, um, it says, say, okay, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints, uh, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. I think, I think what he's saying there, and in many other passages which I was going to read, as we go on, that uh, he's saying th- it isn't you shouldn't do the things that they do. For one thing, uh, as if you if this is characteristic of your life, you have not you know you are not regenerated. You have not seen God. Uh, in fact, that's a that's an important uh, passage. I got to find it here in my notes. Okay, uh, John, Third John, he says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now, surely you couldn't say that a person, I guess this is sort of a question, that a person who did something evil, like, you know, David and his adultery and, and murder and all that, or any, any sin, um, that a person, once having committed a sin, that means they haven't seen God. Well, they have or they haven't. If they, like, say, if you committed a serious sin, would you count that you had never known God or that you had just cut him up? You did know him once. And now, apparently, you don't anymore. So you, but I think this, John is saying here is what I, my position is, is that people who, even though they might be in the church, they might have tasted of, you know, the Holy Gift, they might have been hanging around the saints and in the church environment, they have never really truly believed, and I know you hear this argument all the time, uh, unto salvation, and they have not seen God. But anyone who has, I believe, is secure, and there's a lot of, scriptures we'll be looking at as we go on, but uh, surely, you know, you can't say that someone who commits a sin, that means they never knew God. Well, no, they did, but they blew it according to, you know, the Catholic understanding, and uh, I don't know, that little considered uh, verse from John, and there are others like it, it says that um, us and them, okay, they do these things, you don't, and in most of the times in the epistles he's talking to the real saints in the church. But whenever you're talking to a group of people like that, there are always going to be those who are not. That's why he warns, you know, examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. Uh, but the real saints, those who are really redeemed, there are all kinds of uh, uh, scriptures to, uh, directed at them that shows, okay, this is what they do, not you. Like uh, 1 Thessalonians, when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So it's like, you know, most of the time it's talking to saints who really, they are in, dar- in light. They shall never perish, as, as it's written, you know, once... They are, we have, therefore, having peace with God, uh, therefore, uh, well, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it is, it's an either-or situation. It's always addressing people on one side and people on the other, and I don't think you ever see anything about passing from life back into death, passing from light back into darkness. The warnings there, I believe, are for those who are either on the fence, not redeemed, or just general descriptions of those who never were and never even will be. Sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, in response to the citation from John, in John, for instance, in 1 John uh, 3, 9, um, he says, Whoever is born of God committeth not sin. 
for his seed abideth not in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And so what he's really discussing there is that those who have the grace of spiritual rebirth, those who have justification, do not commit these sins. And so when it says he hath no, not known God, that can very readily be understood to mean that he does not know God as long as he commits those sins. Because in that very same text, which really gives the flavor of what John is dealing with, he talks about how there's a sin unto death, or in First John uh, 5, he, and there's a sin not unto death. And he, in that context, basically says that those who commit the sin unto death know not the Son of God. And so that's basically the context he's dealing with. But Jesus himself indicates that, like you said, that you don't believe that these people were truly believers, or that one can believe and fall away, or one can be of the light and then go back to the darkness. Well, Jesus himself indicates clearly that people can believe for a time, and the parable of the sower indicates that, and Scripture explicitly says that, that they believe for a time and then fall away. And really there's no answer for 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where St. Paul himself, obviously we would both agree, he was a true believer, yeah, he, yeah. He, he says that he could become a reprobate. And he uses the same word that's used in 2 Timothy 3, 8 and in Romans 1, 28. And if you look at what Romans 1, 28 says, it's clearly someone who's not justified. Okay, And so he's saying he sh could become this. So, I mean, he's clearly indicating that a believer, and then we have all kinds of other passages like Second Peter 2, 20 to 22, which says, quote, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, you might say, he didn't really believe. Well, that doesn't work, because in the same chapter, he draws an analogy to the angels that sin. Okay, angels who were in the good favor of God. And then God cast them down into hell. And he also goes on to say, after uh, talking about how people, through the knowledge of the Savior, were um, had escaped from the pollutions of the world, he goes, like a sow or a pig who was washed and then returns to wallowing in the mire. So he uses the words of being washed and then returning again to the mire. So he's clearly indicating through numerous usages there that this is someone who has been washed, who has been justified, and could return. And then we see in the book of Hebrews uh, 6, Four to six. Quote, I was just going to read that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and were mar made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify themselves the Son of God. In Hebrews ten, I'll just quote that, and then I'll let you respond. For if we sin willfully. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. And one last point, the Ephesians 5, it's not just talking about like one other Protestant tried to argue and um, something I heard. He tried to say that, well, Ephesians, not everyone who's in, you know, a church building, like a Protestant church building, is in the church itself. Well, Ephesians, again, I want to emphasize, 5 is talking about people who were light. So the sacred scripture is clearly indicating that these are people who are justified and that they can be partakers with the people who are unjustified. So you can go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I take the partakers to mean, and there, there are a number of scriptures about that, and it says, uh, it says don't do the things they do, but it doesn't say you'll actually be condemned along with them. Um, the uh, uh, you were mentioning, or was it? Oh, the Hebrews thing. That raises questions on both. Hebrews six raises questions on both sides of the aisle. It is impossible if, uh, if they were enlightened, they've tasted a heavenly gift. Okay, uh, if they shall fall away to remove, renew them again unto repentance. Now, this one would seem to indicate that a person could never be saved. They wouldn't be able to go back and be saved if they had, uh, you know, gained salvation and then lost it again. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one to understand. It'd be just as easy to uh, take it to mean that somebody who had been as close as they could ever be, known everything, had all the revelation they could ever have, and have hardened their hearts 
finally, once and for all, uh, irrevocably against the truth. Like Judas Iscariot, for example. Do you believe that Judas Iscariot was a Christian and then he fell, or was he never? I think he was never, because Jesus said he's the son of perdition. Uh, well, I, I would say that that's a debatable issue. Whether he, it, it is. I, I believe that people can be, of course, but whether he in particular was, that is a, a matter of debate. Okay, that's, yeah, I don't think... He was an apostle, he was a, you know, all of that, but was he a Christian while being an apostle? That's the question, and it is. It's not clear whether he ever was. We know he didn't, I've heard people say that Judas Iscariot is in heaven. It's like, well, they must never have read the Bible. There's pretty much nobody in Scripture that uh, is singled out and identified as being condemned. Well, you said that this, the Scripture doesn't indicate that these people can fall away, that, right? That's what you, you said something to the effect that the Bible nowhere says that these were people who were, you know, justified and then unjustified, or indicating that possibility, right? I, I don't think it does, no, no. Well, what about Romans 11, where it talks about how, let me just get the exact quote, it talks about how, you know, you were grafted in, the Gentiles were grafted in, okay, and that, let me just find it here, uh, sorry. Yeah, don't be haughty, but fear, you know, uh, lest you be brought. If the God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't right. you either. Unless you and continue in goodness, yeah. you also will be cut off, he says. And so he's clearly indicating to the believers that they, here it is, Romans eleven twenty to 22, well, because of unbelief they were broken off. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, that's one of those ones that makes you, that gives you pause. And here's one, uh, I'm assuming I you didn't, uh, interrupt before when I was talking, but I'm assuming you're not a Calvinist, right? I mean, correct. I'm yeah, not. I mean, it would be pretty hard to be, you know. And I mean, uh, well, you could say you're not a Calvinist because that's not the teaching of the church, but it's probably your own personal conviction too. I mean, if you didn't know the church and you read the scripture, you'd probably come to that conclusion as well that that God really does extend salvation and everybody has the uh, the option of receiving it or not. But there is a verse in scripture that Calvinists don't even use that much which is pretty strong, and it makes you go, hmm, it makes you wonder how that could be, but we just don't understand everything. And the one you're citing about Romans, about the being broken off, is one of those ones where I go, hmm. Listen to this one from uh, Matthew 11. Uh, and now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So it makes it sound as if God just said, okay, I, re I will not, I'm not willing to save Sodom. I, I could have saved them by doing mighty works, but I just decided, I just reprobated them, as the Calvinists would say, to hell the whole lot, whereas he went and saved all of Nineveh, Nineveh through the preaching of Jonah. That one, Matthew 11:23, gives me pause, but in light of, you know, God extending the offer of salvation to everybody so many times in Scripture and commanding all men to repent, he wouldn't command someone to do something that's not possible, like sin, for example, when he says, be perfect, be holy, the Holy Spirit, I believe, enables every believer to avoid all sin. You know, there's never a sin that you have to commit. Uh, it's just people don't appropriate that often enough. But uh, so, yeah, that's one of those verses in Romans that makes me gives me pause. But there are so many others that makes it sound that when a person is really transla transferred from d uh, death into life, uh, and you know, they follow the shepherd, they won't follow uh, a hireling, but they follow the shepherd. They know his voice. I give unto them life, and they will never perish. I, I can't help but see uh, so many scriptures there where I can't come to any other conclusion. Um, let me look up some more here. Go ahead. Well, in regard to Matthew 11:23, that doesn't clearly indicate. It doesn't indicate at all that salvation is by faith alone or no, eternal no, security. Just, I'm just saying it's a it's a an issue that gives you pause to think about what the other side is saying. Because I want to say that um, there are a lot of things, and I don't mean this uh, in any offense at all, when we get to, on other times, when we get to these other issues, which I hope we do, uh, because they're more, I don't know, they're clearer, I think. 
that uh, a lot of the positions that the doctrines of the Catholic Church that I, I just don't get. I just don't understand how anybody can believe them. This one is, is actually not, is not far out at all. The idea that you could lose your salvation, I don't believe it. But I don't well, but I, I, I mean, I don't see how anyone could hold that position. I mean, you obviously, there's no way around Romans 11 and a lot of these other passages. I mean, that's as clear as daylight, that saying that they can be cut off. And, and to refuse to believe that is simply to just reject the Word of God. And so, uh, and all the other parables which indicate, I mean, why would the Holy Ghost, and you claim to believe that the Bible is inspired, why would the Holy Ghost inspire the writer of James to say that you are not justified by faith alone? When, when that's the true biblical doctrine, according to you. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think what James is saying there is often misunderstood. I actually have a quote here from Augustine, uh, uh, attributed to Augustine anyway. I don't know what, what the context of it says, but the quote it says that, and this is exactly how I put it, exactly as the words I use. Paul and James do not contradict each other. Good works follow justification. I think what James is saying is when he says, if a man has faith and not works, can his faith save him or can faith save him, depending upon the translations. I think what he's saying there is, can that faith save him? Can a faith like that, a faith that do, does not produce good works, is no, is no kind of faith at all, where we're ordained uh, to walk in good works. I mean, that's, that's, we are saved uh, and ordained that we should walk in good works. A faith that doesn't produce good works is not a real faith. That's why the, all the emphasis about doing good and everything, because you know, that's what saints are supposed to do. Um, the... Uh, well, uh-huh. unless you want to continue. No, 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 go ahead. Um, well, no, he clearly indicates that it's not by faith alone that faith, if it has not works, is dead. Um, can faith save him if he has not works? And the answer is no. But the reason, uh, the and it's really interesting when you get into it, for instance, and you're probably you know familiar with this or something you might even quote, in the book of Romans, um, chapter 4, it talks about how, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Right. But in, in James 2, it says that Abraham was justified by works. Okay, so, you know, some people say, well, how do you reconcile the two? And the answer is, when you understand what um, is being said, it really highlights the error of faith alone, and it proves the Catholic teaching on justification because Abraham was actually justified three different times according to the Bible. He was justified in Genesis chapter 12 when he was originally called. It says that he was justified in Genesis chapter 15 when he believed God about the number of descendants he would have. Right. And he was justified again in Genesis 22 when he uh, offered up Isaac. And so, in Romans, okay, St. Paul is trying to explain to the people that you don't have to be in the Old Testament system, circumcision, etc., to be justified. And so, in Romans 4, he specifically says that Abraham was justified not in circumcision, Right, he wasn't circumcised. But in uncircumcision, okay, and he uses the example of how Abraham was justified in Genesis 15 before circumcision was instituted in Genesis 17. Okay, so the, when he says that Abraham was not justified by works, it's clearly to prove the point that, in other words, Abraham was justified outside of the Old Testament system. But in, in James 2, when it's talking about the Christian life in general, it's not talking about trying to distinguish how people can be justified outside the Old Testament system. He says that Abraham was justified by works, because works are a part of the justification process. So it, it further highlights the Protestant error of misinterpretation, and that works are a part of justification. And so that's, that's pretty clear. I don't know. Actually, in Romans 4, where he's talking about Abraham... It says, now to him that work is, is, uh, is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if, if our works were actually helping to justify us, it would be God would be owing us. You know, it, it wouldn't be, as the, gospel, as the Bible clearly presents it, a free gift. This would be something God owes us. But God doesn't owe us anything, no matter how much work we do. But it goes on, to him, in Romans 4 or 5, 
to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. Now, when it talks about works, it isn't always talking about the Old Testament works of the law, I don't believe. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I, I do believe that, that there's a very strong case for uh, justification by, uh, by faith. And, of course, if that does not, if works do not follow, then it was not a real justification. That's by, your, by their fruits ye shall know them. Uh, do you, do you then, believe that in the Old Testament people who had justification lost it? Uh, people who had justification, do I believe they lost it in the Old Testament? Yeah, do you believe that in the Old Testament a, a justified person could lose his justification? No, no. Well, how do you explain David and Solomon? And I don't believe it ever says they lost their justification. I know they were, uh, they were, they sinned and their sin was forgiven, but they were punished temporally. That's the thing. God punishes temporally, so we don't have to fear eternal damnation to be to fear God because He does punish temporally. He made, I, uh, He made uh, uh, Uzziah a leper. I mean, you know, He He does things to people. He really does. The very uh, uh, ex, uh, stern things sometimes. God, He He punished Moses. He didn't even get to go into the promised land. You don't believe Solomon lost his justification when he was worshiping all kinds of false gods? Um, no, I don't. Well, he, according to most scholars, he came back in the end. And well, that's not indicated in the Bible, but the point is that, see, you're... I don't believe he wrote uh, Ecclesiastes at the end and said, okay, now, I, I did all this in my life, but here's the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. You don't believe that that was the... Solomon was uh, turned back to the Lord? I mean, obviously he fell... I, I believe that, that one could have a, a debate about whether Solomon repented. Okay, right. but it's my understanding that it's not definitive. Um, but, I mean, see, that this is part of the inconsistency of the position you have, because it's not a true position, that you're forced to admit that someone who falls into idolatry, as Solomon did, okay, and worships a host of different false gods, a thoroughly, became thoroughly wicked after being chosen with special and unique wisdom and blessing from God. He became thoroughly depraved and wicked, not only sexually, but also um, in idolatry. And you believe that a person who commits idolatry can still be a worshiper and justified by the true God. And that is simply, it's illogical, it's false, but that is consistent with the false position you hold. And as far as David goes, he was clearly justified. He clearly lost his justification. In 2 Kings 12, 13, well, or in Protestant Bibles or others, 2 Samuel 12, 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath taken away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Okay? So that's indicating clearly that if he had not repented, he would have died the spiritual death, and that his sin of adultery and murder would have merited for him a spiritual death. And, I mean, there's so many other passages, like in Romans 8, speaking of spiritual death, and this Romans 8 comes in the very context of a lot of the passages that Protestants cite and misunderstand. It says that... Um, Romans 8, 12 to 13, Therefore, brethren, speaking to the believers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Live. There's no eternal security there. He's clearly indicating that you can die. I mean, it's as plain as daylight. And I think, I think what he's saying there is uh, it, it goes with the examining yourself to see if you be in the faith. If a person finds that they live after the flesh, then they, they really need to uh, question themselves whether they're not they question themselves. They're told basically don't fool yourself because if you do these things, if this is your life, you have not seen God. I believe it, it's, it is a question of have you ever seen God or not. Now, we know that Paul was a Christian, but look what he says in Romans 7. Uh, he's talking about his struggle with sin and in the inner man, uh, oh, this, this reminds me of something you said about uh, Luther. Now, I'm certainly no fan of Luther, but... Can you hold on one sec? Do you mind? All right, sure. sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, speaking of Luther, I'm certainly no champion or apologist for Luther. I haven't even read much of his stuff. What I read, I didn't like, that's for sure. 
Um, but uh, actually, I don't know how anybody could be in a church named after a man. That just blows my mind. Yeah, I agree. Uh, after the Corinthians are being blasted for saying, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos, and they're in a church that says, I am of Luther. That just, I, I don't get that. I'm sorry. But um, you, uh, Luther said something that, uh, that we're declared righteous, but we're still sinful inside, like a, I think it was a dunghill covered with snow. Right. And you, and you disagreed with that. But I think the Bible actually affirms that. Because Paul says the law of sin is at work in his members in Romans 7, that he's, you know, in the inner man he delights after the law of God, but the other law of sin is in his members, and he doesn't, it isn't just temptation, apparently, he seems to be doing sins. He says, I do uh, sin, you know, uh, the evil that I would not do, that I do, O wretched man that I am. And then, immediately after that, he goes on to say, a famous Protestant verse, as you know, because, uh, as you point out, there didn't used to be chapter divisions. There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, surely he's not talking about others besides himself. I mean, he walks after the Spirit, even though his flesh has, has issues, and he, and he seems to. I'm sure they weren't really big sins or anything. But uh, he affirms that there is no condemnation. If you're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Uh, and he says the law has uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made him free from the law of sin and death. Uh, even though he has problems, he has been delivered. And I think that's that's it. I think if, I believe in progressive justification. Sure, we're not as sinful as we used to be, but we uh, still will always struggle. I think the analogy of a dunghill with snow over it is fairly accurate because uh, just like uh, we are uh, covered. With Christ's righteousness, we have maybe some of our own that that we is you know we uh, are able to achieve through the Holy Spirit, but like in the parable of the wedding garment, uh, that's the covering. As far as I'm concerned, that's the covering that the man shows up in there and he doesn't have the wedding garment and he's thrown out. Uh, and it says uh, to put on Christ. I do believe we are covered by His righteousness as much as we can generate uh, our own through the Spirit and, and through our efforts. I don't think that in any way contributes to our salvation or pleases God or is satisfactory to God at least as far as salvation goes because I think the whole division between venial sin and mortal sin is kind of almost an insult to God because even a venial sin any violation of God's law in any way you know I mean if you stumble at one point of the law you're guilty of all any sin would disqualify you from God's presence forever I don't think there's anything you could ever do about it um, well, can I respond to that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, with regard to the Romans 7 and St. Paul, and, and, and this is part of the big problem with Protestant theology and this false idea of eternal security, is that people ignore just tons of passages in Scripture, okay, and even in Romans itself, and they'll focus on when St. Paul is dealing with some rather uh, complex issues such as concupiscence, which, according to Catholic teaching, which is the biblical teaching, concupiscence is, as a result of original sin, people have an inclination to sin that they can willfully resist. Okay? And that's what he's talking about there and the law within his members. Okay? And people misunderstand that to mean that they necessarily commit grave sin. No, he's actually just talking about the inclination that people have as a result of original sin. He's dealing with that complex topic. Also, in other parts of Romans, he's talking about how the Old Testament system is no longer binding. And in other topics, he's pointing out a true view of predestination, which does not exclude free will, but how God orders things for those who are eventually going to be saved in a way that is fit with his own will and that it's not bound to their own preconceived notions about how it must be limited to those who were involved with the Jewish system and so forth. But as far as, um, you know, you're saying that that seems to favor the idea that people who are committing sins, you know, are justified, etc. Well, the Bible's clear that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12:14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And in Revelation, it talks about how nothing impure shall enter the kingdom of God. And even in Romans 5.5, 5, it says, A hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, which is given to us. And that clearly, strongly indicates 
that the love of God is poured into the hearts of the justified. It's not like an external covering like Luther believed, like the dung covered by snow. It's an interior change. And that's also why in 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it is, where it talks about the fornicators, etc., can't be saved, it indicates how, but you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified. Okay, whereas Luther believed, and a lot of Protestants believe, that you're justified because you're declared just, but you're still wicked, and sanctification is separate. Okay, whereas in 1 Corinthians 6, it indicates that the people are sanctified, justified. It says sanctified before justified, indicating that they come together. They're one and the same thing. And so one last point, then I'll let you respond, is that people ignore all kinds of clear passages in Romans 8, in Romans 11, in Romans 2, okay, indicating that works are involved in salvation, human deeds are involved in salvation, you must continue in goodness, you can be cut off, if you live after the flesh you will die. They just ignore all that. And they focus on when he's dealing with a complex issue such as concupiscence. And also, uh, we learn right in Second Peter uh, 3, 15 to 16, say, the Bible itself tells us that St. Paul deals, it specifically mentions St. Paul, deals with things that are hard to be understood, yeah. which people twist to their own damnation. So we have a further indication that there are some passages in St. Paul that people will twist and that are difficult, and among those are obviously those expressing concupiscence. Well, he even says, he said that, you know, people were misquoting him, saying, now I know this is not based on his writings, but people were, well, yeah, probably based on his writings, too, that people were misquoting Paul, saying, you know, uh, they slanderously affirm that we say, you know, let's sin, that grace may more abound, you know, and, and God forbid, of course, a person who, you know, uh, uh, is justified wants to avoid sin at all costs. About the nothing impure uh, entering the kingdom of heaven, that's the thing, it's just that whatever level of righteousness we might attain, even a even the tiniest sin, even the most venial sin, would be, would, uh, I, that's why I believe it's either or. You're either completely justified, and, I, and that's a, a, de a declaration. I think that's a forensic declaration. God says, okay, not counting men's sins, I don't have the reference handy, but not counting men's sins against them. It is not that there's nothing there. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But he doesn't count men's sins against them. You either are robed in the righteousness of Christ, which is basically, it's borrowed. I mean, you may have some of your own, but it's still 100%. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which, as far as the law, at least externally, I know some of them were pretty wicked, uh, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But I think it is. It's an either or. You're either 100% righteous uh, through Christ or not, because even the tiniest sin, stumbling at one point of the law, makes you guilty of all. And uh, so I think that, I do believe in that righteousness it comes entirely from Christ. And the, I'm sure we'll get into this another time, but the part about uh, the judgment seat of Christ and every man's works being tried, uh, the fire will try each man's works, I believe that's where works come in, where if anyone's works are uh, hay or stubble, they will they'll suffer loss. And there will obviously, according to some other scriptures, be levels of reward and levels of uh, There'll be levels of punishment in hell, degrees of punishment in hell, and levels of reward in heaven. And I think that's where the works come in. Uh, and if Paul didn't want to suffer loss and lose, you know, rewards, but the man himself shall be saved uh, as by fire. And it also says, if the righteous be hardly saved, again, I don't have the scripture right in front of me, but if the righteous be hardly saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? I think the righteous are hardly saved, barely saved, because... They only have one thing in their favor, and that's the righteousness of Christ. If they dare to try to go it on their own, it, they're going to fail in some respect. Because so how do you understand I, if the righteous will hardly be saved? What do you think that means? Um, uh, I believe that if the righteous be hardly saved, that means that they are saved uh, only through the righteousness of Christ. It isn't anything of their own. That's barely. I mean, they're saved to the uttermost, but barely saved because... That's the only thing it, that, that gets them there, whereas the sinner and the ungodly have absolutely nothing going for them except a mountain of sin and uh, unbelief, which is, by the way, I believe the only sin that leads unto death is uh, unbelief, uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, rejecting Christ.
Uh, well, yeah. with regard to the venial sin objections, everyone, I would say, knows in their conscience that there's a difference between unjustifiable uh, outbursts of anger and uh, murder. Okay, so the idea that, you know, it's all basically the same is a convenient a false argument that people adopt so that they can sort of not have to worry about any sin because, well, it's all the same. Um, in fact, but, I think, sorry to interrupt, but in fact, I, I, I agree with you completely on that. I think that it specifically says, it doesn't say worse, but it says sexual sins, for example, are, you're sinning against your own body, indicating that those are worse sins. No, of course I believe in worse sins. If you call someone, you know, a, a, a name or you're mad at them or whatever, whether you uh, or whether you murder them, obviously those are different sins. I just think even the tiniest sin, God could not bear. Uh, he cannot have sin in His presence. It would, it would exclude you from heaven. And I know that's where it well, comes in in Catholic theology, but I don't believe that, of course. You know. Well, but the Bible here. The problem with that is that the Bible indicates that there are certain sins which will exclude a person from heaven. Okay, and like First John five sixteen says that there's a sin unto death, and there's a sin not unto death. Those are the exact words. So not all sins are unto death, and when it enumerates certain sins in First Corinthians six. Ephesians 5 and Galatians 5. It doesn't say, you know, everything. It, it specifically mentions things that involve grave matter. And so the Bible indicates that there are certain grave sins that exclude a person from heaven. But I would like you, you know, if when you do start again, if you could try to explain 1 Corinthians 9, where St. Paul says that he himself could become a reprobate, using the same word that indicates uh, unbelievers. But there's so many other ind indications and clear teachings in the Bible where it's undeniable that works are involved in the salvation process. For instance, the um, I mentioned the parable of the sower, how people believe for a time and then fall away, and that some fall away because of the care of riches or the care of this life. Um, and so their actions determine whether they are saved. It's not by faith alone. And then we have the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, where Jesus clearly indicates that he gave, you know, certain talents to a person, and the people who faithfully acted, okay, and gained more talents were rewarded with salvation. But people who didn't do anything, didn't produce anything for God with his grace, we're not, we're damned. That is, Faith without works is dead, absolutely. Yeah. No, but he's saying that he gave this person things. It's not that he didn't give it him faith or give him what they needed to begin with. He gave it to them, and they didn't do anything with it. And so it's not by whether they believed, it's based upon whether they acted. And so there, there's no way to reconcile faith alone with that. And then we have in 1 Corinthians 13 how, though I have all faith, if I do not have charity, I am nothing. And that we, St. Paul tells us that faith is the greatest of faith, hope, and charity. Well, if faith grants you salvation, it wouldn't be the greatest. Okay, charity is the greatest, obviously because you need charity and faith to be saved. That's why St. Paul talks about how uh, we are saved through faith working through love in uh, Galatians. And so, as I mentioned earlier, every passage that has to do with judgment is based on works. In the Apocalypse, it's abundantly clear that people are saved or not saved based upon whether they overcome. Okay, if you hold fast, it doesn't say you will hold fast, like in Revelation 3, hold fast that that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown, and on and on and on. But it, I guess you could respond. Yeah, it's true. It, it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives to the death. I guess you could take that to mean that they did not shrink back. They gave their lives for Christ because that's what was called upon at the time, and they overcame that way. But uh, it also says that uh, the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, and what must we do to work the works of God, the work of God is to believe on him who he sent. But let me answer the thing about loving, uh, about uh, without love I am nothing, without charity. Um, we know, First John says, we know that we have passed from death 
unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. I think that's another one of those test yourself things. You know, if, if you think yourself a Christian and you don't love the brethren, you're abiding in death. I think John and Paul perfectly agree on this point. As, as for the, um, the sower, I, 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 think it's a, I, I, don't, I think it's a misunderstanding when people say when the word believe, every time someone believes, they believe, they take that to mean that they're actually saved and they really believe and they have faith in everything. The sower, the people in the parable of the sowers, only the, the ones that bore fruit were the ones that the uh, seed fell on good soil. I think those are the ones the only, that really believed and mixed it with faith, as it says in, I'll have to look that up, but um, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, where it says be people believe. Like, for example, Simon the sorcerer believed. Well, he didn't stay saved for very long. Immediately after that, he's trying to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit and everything. I don't think he believed anything. His heart was not right with God, as they, as they told him. Um, but the Word of God says he believed. Well, it says he believed. Just like I don't think when it says death and die that it always means eternal. Uh, I don't think I would believe always means they really believe, because a lot of people believe and bear absolutely no fruit, and they fall away immediately. Uh, if Simon ever really believed and repented, it was outside of the text. They, didn't, they don't record that. Um, this passage from Hebrews 10, Now the just shall live by faith. I know, I know, that's, that's Luther's thing, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now a Catholic or somebody who holds to that view might say, well, there you go. Uh, somebody who does not stay faithful like the people in the parable of the sower uh, God will have no uh, soul uh, God's soul will have no pleasure in them but then he goes on to say we are, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul he's in most of the cases where he's addressing the churches he says we are not of the day uh, or we are not of the night uh, the wrath of God comes upon wait I'll look that one up here in a second but anyway I believe in most of the times it is rude giving assurance, it is uh, uh, comforting and giving assurance. There's always warnings, of course, that have to be addressed to the same groups because of the people who are in the church who are not sincere. Um, but anyway, go ahead. i got to look something up. Here. Well, with regard to the parable of the sower, it, it clearly indicates that this is seed which for time was uh, growing. Okay, uh, for instance, in Matthew thirteen eighteen through 22, it says, Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. Okay, uh, right before that, the verse before that is, The same as he that heareth the word, and presently with joy receiveth it. Okay, so Jesus Christ himself says that this person received the word. It's not someone... With, this is not seed that was rejected right away. This is seed that was received, okay, and remained for a time, as we read in Mark 4:17. And so it's simply not consistent with what the Scripture says to say, well, that person didn't really receive the word ever to begin with. That's that's not correct. And then I quoted earlier Second Peter 2:20 to 22 talking about people who are washed and then returning to the mud. Obviously, that's a justified person returning to the unjustified state. And it says that they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Savior. They are again entangled therein and overcome. And throughout Revelation, I mean, you seem to admit it or concede it in a certain way that, you know, it's clearly indicating that people's actions determine whether they overcame and will overcome. And it's consistently talking about um, how their works will be the determining factor of whether or not they shall be saved. And then we have in 1 Corinthians 7, where it's talking to believers clearly in 1 Corinthians, this is made clear in 1 Corinthians 5:12. It says that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And he says that um, I say to people, to marry than to burn. it is better to marry than to burn. Now, you're, by the way, you're, I meant to mention that. That's very interesting. You're the only person that I've ever heard that takes that to mean, like, burn in hell. Now, everybody else, in fact, some of the translations even say it means to burn with passion or be, in other words, it's better to marry than to go around thinking passionate thoughts and being in lust and everything. It's better just to marry because, as he says when, uh, in uh, another epistle, it says that, okay, you know, it's not a sin to marry, but it's better not to. And anybody would agree with that. Obviously, the, the, the simpler life, the better life would be 
to not be married to just serve the Lord because you are divided and you do have to take care of your wife and everything and your husband. If you're married, the best thing, of course, is to serve the Lord. But, of course, the human race doesn't operate that well, way. Well, I don't think most Protestants would admit what you just admitted. About burning? No, about that it's better not to be married. They would say, well, that, in fact, many of them say that celibacy is evil. And that it's, oh, no. and they misinterpret certain passages where it talks about how they'll bring in new doctrines forbidding uh, marriage, et cetera, condemning marriage, when it's just talking about a Manichaean, type, dualist type of mentality, people who think that all flesh is evil, people who think that the material world is evil. That's what it's talking about. But these people interpret that to mean that it's a hellish doctrine, celibacy. So for you to admit that, I think that is somewhat rare among Protestants. No, I, I don't, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, obviously everybody can't do it. As she says, not everybody can have this gift. Everyone has this different gift from God. One man this and one man that. Everybody doesn't have the gift of singleness, but it does put you in a... So you say person. that it's just, it's not referring, in your opinion, to burning in hell? No, no, I, no, I don't think so, so at all. Even though it says in that very context, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, and the Bible tells us that fornicators burn in hell. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I've never heard anybody take it that way. I think it just means to. Uh, and again, I'm not. I don't know Greek and everything except for a handful of words. Uh, but I don't think it means to burn. I think it means to, you know, to be. Of course, you don't want to to be a fornicator. But a person could conceivably uh, not marry, not fornicate, but still be distracted by you know desires of the flesh, which are like natural and everything. And I my objection to the whole celibacy thing, by the way, is you know the whole. Timothy, First Timothy, doctrines of demons thing. I think to tell someone you can't mar marry, that's a doctrine of demons. And I know the church has explained that by saying, well, we don't tell priests they can't marry. We just choose men from among those who uh, have chosen not to marry. I think that's kind of a game, really. I don't. I think they have forbidden people to marry, really. And the, you know, the Orthodox do the same thing, only with a with a twist. It's just the just the high ones they can't marry. The other ones have to be, which I think is wicked too, to say someone has to be married, you know. But so the you, you say the priests have to be married, you know. Well but Saint Paul himself says that it's better not to marry. And you're saying that it's a doctrine of devils. Well to to forbid to marry is a doctrine of devils. Right. It, no, of course celibacy is not of, of devils, of course, that's that's fine. But uh, to say to someone they can't is a doctrine of devils. That's what I'm saying. Well, what do you see? that's the passage I was referring to earlier, First Timothy 4, and a lot of people misunderstand that. It's not talking, it has nothing to do with Catholic teaching on celibacy there. It's talking about ever since the beginning of the church, there were Gnostics, and then there were Manichaeans, and then there were uh, the uh, other groups during the Middle Ages who had this dualist idea that there were two gods, a god of matter and a god of the spirit, and everything of matter was uh, evil. And they would, the most extreme among them, forbid people from marrying because that was, okay, of the flesh, of material created things. And so that's what it's talking about. The, that heresy has gone back since the beginning of the church. Uh, and the Cathars were another group who... Uh, who held that heresy, basically, which originated back in the beginning. So it's not talking about celibacy at all, but it is a contradiction, I believe, definitely, for you to say that the Bible is clearly teaching that it's better to be unmarried, but... If you can, if, 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 you, know, if you can do it, if you have that gift, I mean... Right, and the, and the Church is saying that the call to the religious state or the priestly state is, is a more, is a higher dedication, and so... You should pattern yourself after what the Bible teaches is the better state and way to serve God. And so yeah, there's... And uh, uh, considering the current distress, you know, considering what was going on at the time, it would be definitely not, you know, to drag a wife into, a, you know, uh, the persecution or whatever that was going on at the time. Um, I want to know what you thought about a, a particular, a uh, couple of particular verses, actually. Uh, in First John, where it says, you probably hear this one pretty often too. First uh, John two nineteen, which says, they went out from us; they were not of us. For if this is where I believe that real believers stay believers, and then they don't fall away completely. They might, you know, they might backslide, they might whatever, but they don't fall away completely. They, if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
that's a pretty strong one for uh, the people who turn away, the people like the, the, the seed, uh, the, the, the people with the, uh, in the parable of the sower, and, you know, people like Judas and everything, uh, that if they were, they were of us, if they were really of us, they would have continued with us, but the fact that they left just proves that they never were. I think John is affirming what I'm saying there, is that real believers stay believers, and those who just, you know, kind of hang around the periphery don't, you know. Yeah, and I've, you know, given a lot of thought to that passage, and when I read that passage, it's very clear to me what he's saying, because we've dealt with a lot of people who might be, you know, interested in the information, and people we've even met, okay, who um, they appear to be in agreement, but you can sense from the beginning that they're not really of one mind. They don't really have that true internal conviction and, and outlook on things the way uh, you do, okay? And so if they, you know, go off to following something else or believing something different, um, it doesn't surprise you because you sense really that they really didn't believe. And so I think all he's ex clearly expressing there is that with many people, that's the case. They really weren't of the truth. He doesn't say that that's the case with everyone. And um, he's just simply expressing that about certain people. And, in fact, uh, he may be referring to a few people in particular in that passage. And I can totally understand what is being said there, whereas we clearly, as I mentioned, have all these passages, which I don't even think you've addressed, uh, tried to address them, like Second Peter 2, etc., where it talks about people who are washed, returning to the mud, you know, on and on and on, St. Paul himself saying that he could lose his justification, which indicate that not all who believe remain among them, but some people who just didn't have the same spirit, and therefore that you can see why they didn't stay, because they didn't have the same beliefs and internal conviction. And so that's what I believe is, is clearly being said there. Um, but as far as getting back to the First Corinthians 7, where you try to say that maybe it's referring to burning in passion or something. Yeah, yeah. Not hell, but as I mentioned, it, it specifically indicates in context to avoid fornication, which is, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the very chapter right before that. In fact, a few uh, passages above that, it indicates that fornicators will burn in hell. So uh, that strongly yeah, so indicates that... The, to those who, you know, that's what characterizes their lives. I think a, a real believer who, who stumbles and gets back up, and this, of course, will come in if and when we ever discuss on another day, the, like the priesthood and everything, if somebody stumbles and gets back, uh, sin, you know, the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. If uh, a righteous man falls into that sin, I don't think he, it's not characteristic of him. He doesn't, he's not comfortable with it. His, his inner man, which according to Paul in Romans 7, uh, delights in the things of, of the law of God would be uh, mournful over that and would repent and everything. I don't think that's the same thing as those who live, who, as Peter says, plunge into a flood of dissipation, and they think it's strange that you don't do that. You know, So I think it is different. I think there's a definite difference between even when a believer sins, it's not the, the, it's not the same way that it is when an unrighteous person sins. Um, so you believe that a believer could, for instance, commit fornication sometimes? And well, uh, yeah. <laughs> but see, this is the problem. That... Ever, but yes, I do, yes. Okay. I, th I mean, of course they shouldn't, obviously. And if they had no problem with that, obviously, then they're not a believer. But, I mean, if they, if they their weakness and temptation, if they did that, they would... Uh, where's the line, though? I, I don't agree with that, obviously. But where's the line that, you know, well, he does it once a month, or, or a person does it, you know, once a month, but where does it become, well, that's what defines him, that he is now a fornicator? There is no distinction. Yeah, I, you can't I, I, draw a line. I think it's in the heart. I think it's in the attitude. Like, uh, like Jesus said, Peter, you know, uh, Peter said, how many times shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Seventy times seven. I think God is that patient... And, of course, the, the evil thing comes in when people think, well, I can just push God all I want because he's just going to keep on forgiving me and forgiving me. That attitude could not reside in, this, in the bosom of a real believer, I don't think. But uh, well, you know, see, talk, I'm sorry. That's, the, that's the fundamental problem there because your whole theology is based upon, quote, eternal security, 
Well, obviously someone who's committing fornication, and you say that person can still believe he's eternally secure, that person could have no eternal security. Obviously he doesn't. I, I, just, but for, even from your standpoint, which is false, but let's say we were to adopt that for the sake of argument, right. that this person is committing fornication, well, he's not sure, well, maybe if I'm doing it, you know, this much, then I am defined by that fornication, and therefore I am among the fornicators. Maybe I'm not then eternally secure. Therefore, there, there could be no comfort. There could be no assurance of salvation. Because you'd never know, well, how many sins equates to being defined as a mortal sinner or one of these things that, you know, is part of the category of those who are not saved. Well, that's why a person should, should uh, fear and uh, should purify themselves and uh, flee fornication, flee temptation, and all these things. What it says in Colossians 3, If you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, etc., etc. Then it goes on to say, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which these for which say, uh, things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. And then he goes on for more exhortations about how to act as the elect of God. I think that it's still, even when it talks about sins, it says, okay, that's, the wrath comes upon the children of disobedience, them, them who know not God, and it says in Thessalonians, and he will be revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God and obey not the gospel when clearly in uh, an epistle, I have it written here somewhere, that they, the believers, the saints, have obeyed the gospel. Um, the, uh, well, the reason, it mentions, I'm sorry. the reason it mentions the children of unbelief there is not uh -huh. because only the unbelievers commit those sins or are defined by them. It's because it mentions uh, idols in that context. And so someone who is involved in the service of idols is not a believer. And Solomon. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so yeah. that's but also you mentioned the righteous man falls seven times. Well that contradicts your point that whoever sins in any way, even if it's a minor smallest thing, you said that that's incompatible with the, you know, justice of God and so forth. And that if, you know, sin excluded then it would be anything. Well, no, the, that very verse you indicated or quoted indicates that there can be a minor sin or a lesser sin which is not directly incompatible with the possession of righteousness. And so, go ahead. No, I was going to say, well, I think, uh, sin, any sin would exclude someone from the kingdom of God if they didn't have the righteousness of Christ, you know. Um, but, but, all right, what do you think about this? Ephesians 1, um, the a person who believes, a, a believer, a Christian, a saint, is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And also it says, in whom ye trusted, Ephesians 1, 13 and on, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after also, uh, also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, if a believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit, when they commit a mortal sin, they're unsealed, the Holy Spirit leaves them, and they go back just basically the way they were. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's a, considering all the scriptures, I have a, I have a hard time believing that. Um, well, the, unsealed and the Holy Spirit leaves them. You know. Well, in in actually in baptism, you receive a a seal, a, an indelible mark. This is something the church has always taught, and so even those who lose their justification keep their seal. They keep the character or the mark of baptism. It's that they were marked in baptism, and and that remains with them forever. And so that's one of the things being mentioned there uh, to answer your question but I, I would I don't know if you've tried to respond to it yet what do you do with first Corinthians nine twenty seven about how St. Paul says he could become a reprobate I, I don't you know I don't know how to answer that I really don't I don't think he necessarily means uh, reprobate in that sense um, you know, when he talks about being a castaway it could be uh, a reprobate a disqualified from ministry Shame, disgrace, loses rewards. I don't know. I don't think it means loss because of the, the, you know, the massive uh, amount of scripture that uh, tells the saints that they are sealed, they are secured, they are seated in the and it was heavenly. They have, you know, they have passed over uh, from death unto life. They shall never perish. You know, all of those things. Now, here's a here's an issue that 
as much as both of us disagree with the Calvinists about election, about how actually one becomes the elect, how is the election obtained, there is no denying anybody who reads the scriptures that there is such a thing as the elect, and that uh, right. he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And uh, ah, where's the other one? Where it says, "Faithful is he who called you, and he will do it." So you probably know all these things by heart. But I there, there's I one right in Ephesians one. I mean, there are many references to predestination, and even in even in the decree on justification in the Council of Trent. There are references to predestination, but predestination, which does not exclude free will, of not. and does not predestine anyone unto evil, and so there are many mysteries involved. But um, there are certain things that have to be excluded, such as the notion that God excludes people to hell, and that God uh, doesn't confer free will upon every man. And so, yes, uh, that basically, like it talks about Pharaoh. You know, I raised him up so that I, I could show my glory. And that's quoted by St. Paul in Romans. That basically, we don't know exactly why. Uh, for instance, it could have been from all eternity that God saw how this person would react. He saw how Pharaoh was of bad will. I'm sure that's what it is. And, and so, but he arranged his life in a way that would most contribute to his glory. And so, so there are those mysteries of uh, election and and putting people in certain situations and predestination in that sense, but which does not compromise free will, his goodness, and does not mean that he predestines anyone unto evil. No, no, I think Jesus chose Judas because he knew what he was going to do, you know, and, and uh, that he was the type of person who would betray. He needed a traitor, obviously. Judas, he didn't make Judas do it. He didn't cast him in that role. So, well, I'm going to condemn him because I need to be betrayed so I can save the other guys. No, I think it's um, it is for knowledge. I think it's it's idiotic to say God doesn't know what people will do, which is what many Calvinists say. God doesn't know what people are going to do unless He makes them do it. I mean, that's just absurd. That makes all of eternity just a puppet show, you know. Uh, so no, I don't believe that God uh, causes people. In fact, everywhere this is why I'm so staunchly anti-Calvinist. In almost every instance where you see God blinding someone's eyes or hardening their hearts or sending them delusion. There's always a catch, like in Thessalonians. For this cause he will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? Because they didn't receive the love of the truth, they loved unrighteous, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then God right. hardened it for him afterwards. Yeah, I mean, for knowledge, God just gives people basically more of what they're looking for. I mean, you know, it, 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 it would be wrong. And people say, well, you can't, cast this for, you can't say God is wrong. Well, considering he's pretending to extend salvation to all the earth, uh, it'd be kind of wrong for him to uh, to actually deny it. So they devise theories like the twin truths, the two wills of God, like John MacArthur. Who and I like John MacArthur a lot as a teacher, but this whole two wills of God thing is just out to lunch. I think you know. Well, I think what you're saying applies to the verse you cited earlier, Matthew 11:23, and Capernaum. Uh, shalt thou be exalted up to heaven? Thou shalt go down even down to hell. For if Sodom. In Sodom had been wrought the miracles that have been wrought in thee, perhaps it would have remained unto this day. And so um, it simply could be indicating that if Sodom had seen the miracles that were wrought there, it would have had a different outcome. But Sodom's other sins did not merit it to see these works. And so there's no incompatibility there. And, no, I don't think there is either, no. no. And so uh, I think that that provides basically the answer to what you cited earlier. But as far as the 1 Corinthians 9.27, you seem to admit you don't know what to do with it. Well, no, no, the word he uses there... The scriptures that are hard to deal with. Honestly, really, they are. Well, this one, I mean, this one's clear, that he says that he should become a reprobate. And as I mentioned, the word is adokimus in the Greek. And just to give an example of what this is signifying, the same word is used in Romans 128 to describe these people uh, as they liked, quote, as they liked not to have God in their knowledge. God, God delivered them up to a reprobate sense, okay, being filled with all iniquity, malice, fornication, avarice, okay, detractors, hateful to God, okay, and then there are other passages, I'll just cite one other, and then you can respond, which uses the same word to indicate that it's clearly indicating St. Paul could become an unbeliever, a, a, an unjustified person 
Second Timothy 3.8 also uses the same word, uh, which St. Paul uses, and it says, um, Now as Jonas and Mambras resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. Yeah. Men of corrupted mind reprobate concerning the faith. And so St. Paul says he could become that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's uh people often use the other uh, uh the the fact that the same word is used somewhere else to mean something like for example, if indeed uh, I know the Jerome's Vulgate says full of grace and everything, even if that were the usage, the fact that it were only used once before, uh, referring to Jesus, would not put her, ma Mary, in that same category anyway. By the way, I find it fascinating that you don't believe as, in Mary as a co-redeemer, which, by the way, anybody who's listening, um, who's listening after all this time, I recommend uh, the Most Holy Family Monastery website, mostholyfamilymonastery.com, and uh, the YouTube channel, uh, MHFM1 on YouTube. Fascinating articles and videos and everything. I'm not trying to persuade anybody to become a Catholic, but you will, you'll really be very, very interested in all this stuff. I know I have. Uh, so, uh, now again, uh, take it with a grain of salt, but uh, there's a lot of good uh, teaching, a lot of good information there. Well, thanks. Really that's, I'm, I'm, that's nice of you. Uh, you know, that's why I think that you do have, obviously, some interest in, in um, you know, the things of truth. And so I, I, would, I, I guess I'm just shocked that you could believe these unbiblical heresies. I mean... Uh, just the overwhelming evidence that, uh, for instance, on this topic, that shows that works are involved in man's salvation. I mean, when it's saying you must persevere to the end, I didn't even cut, quote that one, Matthew 10. Um, he, the end will be saved. Of course, many take that to mean that those who are the elect will persevere to the end. I know it's putting it in But the it doesn't say that. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't. But... Um, the, uh, but the election thing, I think it's hard to not reconcile election with, uh, 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 now we could say, well, that person wasn't elect, that person wasn't elect, who didn't persevere. But what about Paul? He says in Galatians 1, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, he's talking about he was chosen, he was called. Now, we believe, of course, that's because God knew he, you know, in spite of his zeal against the church, when he really had full revelation, he would turn and serve uh, Christ. But... He's talking about, he's called, I don't think he ever is concerned for his salvation. Like I said, he goes immediately from Romans 7, where it, it says, it seems to indicate he's actually doing some sins. I'm sure they're not big ones, but some sins. But then he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, and he says, in, um, actually he doesn't say, but he says he was called, uh, separated from his mother's womb. Obviously, he's, you know, God had, was going to see it through, uh, as Peter says in First Peter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are, and this is why I believe in security, one of the reasons, kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I think we are kept by the power of God. And the Calvinists like to argue... Oh, if, well, uh, you have to, if you saved yourself, then you have to keep yourself saved. Well, no, no, not at all. Uh, is that, you know, if you believe in free will, then you have a chance of, and in that way, they almost agree with the Catholics. Uh, they say, well, you know, you have to keep yourself saved. If you sin, then you're going to blow it, you know. But I believe we are, as, as the Scripture says, kept by the power of God. You know? Well, I think what you're referring to there are, and a lot of Protestants cite the passages like, you know, nothing shall you know, take uh, you out of his hand. And, um, for instance, or in Romans 8, a similar passage where it talks about, um, you know, n nothing will separate us from Christ the Lord, things like that. But actually, yeah. what's interesting is in Romans 8, 38 to 39, it says, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor to come nor might nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh -huh. what, what, what didn't he mention there? Sin. Okay? And he, he didn't say, you know, neither sin, etc., shall be, which he would or should have said if what you're saying is true. No, all he's illustrating in those passages about how he keeps them, nothing shall strike uh, these people out of his hand, is that, you know, he, it's not like 
the capricious false gods of the Greeks or whatever who might change his mind or who could be overcome by another false god. No, he is all-powerful, and so if you remain in him, nothing can take you away from him. If you abide in me, keep my commandments. Okay, if you love me, keep my commandments, as he said, if you abide in, in me. But it's very interesting that sin is not mentioned among the things that um, cannot separate a person from the love of Christ. So it would have to be volitional. In other words, when it says neither demons, it means not through temptation, but demons can't basically like jump you and overpower you or anything. You would have to give assent right. to uh, their temptations, and basically you'd be doing, like when Jesus said, no one shall pluck them out of my Father's hands, but you could jump out on your own if you wanted to. Exactly. And, it, and it, it's just simply illustrating his power in that basically there's there's nothing that over can overcome him. And so, and that was obviously a problem with the false gods in the ancient world, that you had, you know, different false gods who would fight with each other, supposedly in their myths, and etc. And they weren't all powerful, and they had deficiencies, etc. Um, they held grudges, they held yeah. grudges, all and, kinds of things. And, um, and so, and then we have other passages, like 1 Corinthians 11, where it talks about that he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That also indicates, obviously, the Eucharistic presence, but that's a separate issue. But the point I want to make here is that, obviously, believers are the ones who are going to be taking part in the Eucharist. And St. Paul says that certain people eat and drink unworthily and drink damnation. It's not that they already were in damnation through unbelief. They drink damnation by a sin against the Eucharistic presence. And so obviously, therefore, this action is involved in his damnation. I, I don't think that means, uh, again, like where every time it says life and death, I don't think it means, you know, eternal. Uh, I do believe when it says damnation, the word is sometimes uh, translated judgment, I think, as in, like he says, many drink and eat unworthily, and some are sick and some die. I think it means that, that kind of judgment, uh, like the sin, you know, uh, the sin unto death could mean either either a, a sin like the sin of uh, unbelief. Again, it's not, I don't think it's terribly clear. The sin of unbelief, which would cause you to lose your soul, which never would be saved, or a sin that God might strike you dead for, like people were undeniably killed for uh, not respecting the Lord's Supper. I don't believe in the real presence, of course, but not respecting the Lord's Supper, being unworthy of it, not uh, examining themselves and forsaking their sins, like Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for the same thing. I think there's a lot of assurance about, uh, like John. John is pretty strong about the eternal security thing. I know some of the verses don't seem to indicate that, but I, I always joke that uh, if you know they say faith without works is dead, well, Catholicism without James is dead because James is used to you know justify a lot of Catholic teaching, like you know extreme unction and things like that. But John has got to be the worst enemy because John says uh, in First John, "Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God." Uh, and now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, and so forth. It seems like there's a lot of uh, every man that hath his hope in him purify themselves. True, uh, and then he goes on to talk about if you commit sin, if you uh, if you abide in sin, whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Uh, whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knows him, which, you know, again, you can't, just doing a sin doesn't mean you never knew God. It says it hath not seen him. I think that uh, people who op abide in sin, obviously not ever sin, because, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we uh, abide in sin, and sin is characteristic of us, I believe that's what it all means. And there's, there are so many verses where it, it says basically to the elect, you know, you're secure, you're sealed, your, uh, your hope is reserved for you in heaven, you're kept by the power of God. I mean, I know we can go back and forth on this. Can you hold on one sec? Sure, sure. Okay, okay. sorry about okay. that. Well, yeah. with, you were going to finish, or go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I mean, it, there are, you know, a lot of scriptures that I think mean this, and a lot of scriptures you, you say mean that, and we have different views on it. Like I said, I'll take one thing to mean that, and you'll take another thing to mean that. I think the, uh, the, you know, the overarching principle or the, the weight of Scripture does speak to security and... Uh, well, I find that amazing. <laughs> when, 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 I mean, you don't even have an explanation 
four, First Corinthians six nine, Second Peter two. I mean, Jesus is clearly indicating that it's judgment on the basis of works that you must persevere to the end. It's not a given, obviously. So Wait, people can. Peter two, Second Peter two. Second Peter two twenty to twenty uh, two, where it talks about how. Um, oh yeah, after escaping the pollutions of the world. Yeah, people escape the pollutions of the world, and, and he compares them to a pig who is washed, vomit, and everything. Yeah, and returns I, to the mud. Yeah, I, 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 but then again, it does seem to raise the question. The, the, the similar passage in Hebrews seems to raise the question of. Well, a person like that could never well, but that, back. But even if that were true, you're, you're, you're not justifying your position by saying, well, that would mean that he could never. What, to, in order to make that argument, you have to admit that a justified person could fall away. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't believe that. No, and, well, and of course that's you know that's where we came in. And then then Romans 11, okay, you know, of course, where it says that you should, you also will be cut off unless you continue in goodness. And then the whole range of Scripture where it's obviously indicating that human works are involved in whether or not. And then we have the only time that Scripture uses the terms faith alone together, and it says it's not by faith alone. Then we have the only time in all of Scripture where Jesus is directly asked, what good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? And he says, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, Matthew 19. He didn't say, faith alone, what are you talking about? You don't have to do anything to be saved. You're already saved, you believe. No, that's not biblical. And as far as John, as I said, that he's talking in the context of those who have overcome the world, okay, and the state of grace and how there's a sin unto death and that those who were involved in those sins, okay, do not uh, abide in him. Because Catholic teaching is, and the biblical teaching is, that the state of grace is incompatible with mortal sin. And you basically admitted the truth of that by your position on fornication. You do believe people can commit sins, which the Bible says, the Bible's clear in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that fornicators, adulterers, etc. shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, you say, well, that only means a person who's defined by fornication. Well, how many times does he have to fornicate? And see, we can see how ridiculous that is. That No, if he fornicates, he's a fornicator. If he commits adultery, he's an adulterer. If he commits murder, he's a murderer. And so that's the, and then you were forced to admit that you believe people can worship idols and remain justified, as in the case of Solomon. And so yeah, back, yeah, backsliding to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that's, a, that's a, the Solomon case is a hard one, really, because um, that's pretty, that's pretty far. Obviously, that's a, a, a heinous sin, worshiping idols. But it, you know, it says he, I don't know. It's, I believe he did turn back, but I think that I don't know. I don't believe that the Bible promotes the idea that basically timing is everything. A person can be justified and basically slip up once and they happen to die at an inconvenient time and they're lost forever like a person cheats at a game of monopoly a justified person gets tempted and under pressure and they cheat at a game of monopoly that was from the archives i think on your website uh... and they're lost for all eternity because of that and i'm not minimizing any sin but i mean if that would be a mortal one for example well uh, well f with regard to that that presupposes a serious game, a game that everyone is involved thinks that you're going to be playing a serious, honest game, and the person cheats. And even there's some so-called traditional Catholics who tried to say, well, that's not a mortal sin. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's that. clearly a mortal sin. Obviously, if it's if it's some you know screw around game which no one's taking seriously, then it might be a venial sin or or no sin at all, depending upon the context. But if it's a serious game where people are expecting honesty, it's simply to lie, and so. Uh, that is a mortal sin, but this what your your objection there contradicts your whole position on how God is in control, how God knew what Pharaoh was going to do, because obviously if God sees God is not going to be cruel, and so it's not like well this person commits a mortal sin and then he happens to die. God allowed this person to die for a reason, and so there can be no injustice there or no uh, problem of inconsistency or you know, a ridiculous scenario created that if God allows someone to, to depart, obviously he allowed them to depart for a reason. 
And so if that person, I mean, he shouldn't be committing that sin. No, and, no. and God gives the grace for that person to overcome. But, I mean, again, the scripture is clear that, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, which doesn't, it isn't consistent with this uh, faith alone, eternal security theology. Then we have um, so many other passages, which, such as uh, another passage I'd, I'd like you to uh, answer in First Timothy 2.15, a woman shall be saved by childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness. Yeah, there are a lot of ifs, not not all. I mean, there are uh, there are a lot of assurances of uh, salvation and the hope in heaven and everything. Like in what? The New Testament, but and uh, some of them come with conditions, as you said, like if you uh, stand fast to the end and all that. Some of them don't. Um, but uh, was it First Timothy um, two fifteen? I, actually, that's another one that just makes you wonder. Like, what does that mean? Saved your childbearing if she continues. You know, that's one of those ones that I don't know what it means. And there are ones that I yeah, because I don't think either one of us can answer what they mean. Well, I mean, they, they they don't indicate that all justified believers are sure of their salvation. Oh, there are things in Scripture that, that don't, like I said, believe doesn't always mean believe unto the saving. It says we are those who, we're not those who turn back unto perdition. We believe unto the saving of the soul. Like even salvation, like it says in First Timothy, um, we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Well, in what sense is God the Savior of men who don't believe? I mean, uh, only in that he, uh, contrary to what the Calvinists teach, died for them and offered them salvation. That limited atonement is one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard, you know. Uh, in fact, that the Bible teaches the exact opposite, you know. But uh, there So you do believe, he, I mean, you answered it right there. And that's, in, he's the Savior of all men because he died for all men. Yeah, uh-huh. Right, but that doesn't mean all men are saved. Of course, they affirm that that means his blood was wasted. Well, that's dumb because the offer is there, the payment was made. People who don't take it are, have no excuse. You know, uh, yeah, I do believe he died for all men. That doesn't mean all men are saved. Obviously, most men will not, according to the, to the scripture. Uh, but you know, yeah, and so there's there's no passage which indicates that uh, all justified believers are saved by faith alone or and or eternal security. There's not one. I think there are. <laughs> and, 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 and there are tons of passages which indicate that people who, uh, that people can lose their salvation, that it's based on works. There are a couple others that I just wanted to ask you about. For instance, James 1, not 2, 1, 13, 15. Uh, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And obviously he's not, ta he's obviously not talking about uh, actual physical death there. I mean, when they commit that sin, they're not dying. Okay, so he's talking about eternal death. Yes, yeah, sin brings forth eternal death, yeah. Right. So, I mean, that, therefore it's not by faith alone. Uh, I think I think also that yeah, like that passage and all throughout where he's talked, where he's uh, like in the uh, the teachings of Jesus, where he's talking about you know avoid this and uh, cut off your hand. Very interesting, by the way, that uh, and nobody believes that Jesus meant to literally cut off your hand. Although they say, well, he said this is my body, so he meant it. But uh, half a dozen other things he said that he didn't mean, like you know. Uh, your branches and waters will come out of your belly and all this stuff. He didn't mean those, but he well, does mean the thing. But that's like call me no man father. He didn't mean yeah, like, that you can never call anyone father. Well, no, I think he means as a as a, a spiritual title. But you know. Well, I mean, but, say, it's, it's, we have uh, in Acts seven where Stephen says, "Brethren and fathers, hear me." Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and I, you know, and he's my true son in the faith, and Timothy's my son in the faith, and all that. Yeah, I just I don't think it means that uh, nobody is called father. I just think as a t when I hear men called father, I think no, that's not right. You know. Well, see, I, it's ironic that you you selectively take that passage literally and absolutely, even though there's there are other passages in Scripture like Acts seven two, where they call their uh, people fathers, and I just I just thought that was a point. But there's another passage I wanted to ask you about. But unless you want to say something. Oh, uh, no. No, good. Okay. Um, it 
comes in First Timothy 5.8, and it says, But if any man have not care of his own, and especially of those of his house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Okay? And so he's saying that if a man does not care for his own house, he has denied the faith. Therefore, he can deny the faith, uh, refuting eternal security. And he is worse than an infidel. It doesn't say he is an infidel, okay, and un- which means unbeliever. He is worse than because he was a believer and then denied the faith. So that clearly indicates that a justified person can deny the faith and become like an infidel even worse than because he was justified and then went back. I think it means to behave in a way, in an issue, uh, in one matter, that is worse than what an infidel would ordinarily do. I don't think it means he denies the faith, like, uh, you know, turns against Christ. I think it's, it's shameful behavior. There are, there's, there are scriptures like that where it says, you know, it's shameful to do what they do. Uh, you haven't learned Christ like that. Don't, uh, you know, don't do what they do. Don't, uh, these are the kind of things that you have put off. Uh, Oh, I just found something I was I wanted to mention earlier about uh, one's own righteousness. Paul says um, uh, in Philippians three that we have no confidence in the flesh. So it is not in my flesh dwells no good thing. He has no confidence in the flesh. Uh, he said, and I would be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law or you know anything. I, I think the law was the example, but I think any human works uh, as far as attaining justification count in the same category, because it isn't always referring to the law. Most of the time it is, because they had the law on their brains from the time they were born. What verse? That, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And Jesus said that life eternal was knowing thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And, uh, oh, you're, ref- you're referring to Philippians 3, 3 and following? Uh, yeah. Well, okay, when you're done, maybe I can respond to that. Okay. Uh, and everything. thing... It, Eternal life is indicated in the scriptures a number of times as knowing Christ. Jesus said it. Uh, Paul said it in Philippians. Uh, First John says it. Um, we know the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true. This is the true God and eternal life, knowing Jesus Christ. Um, and, uh, let's see. yeah, anyway, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, this, this is what I was saying earlier about the classic case of misinterpretation and the general point that I'm making here is that there are clear passages of Scripture which indicates that works are a part of salvation. It's not by faith alone. The Word of God says that directly. The man can believe for a while and fall away. He can lose his salvation. You can be washed and then fall away. You can be cut off unless you continue in goodness. But all the passages you bring up have a very reasonable answer which indicates that it's uh, not saying at all what you think it's saying. You brought up Philippians 3 in the area of 8 or 9, verse 8 or 9, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. And in that very text there, Philippians 3, starting in verse 5, just a few verses before that, it says, St. Paul says, I circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So he's, without any question, it screams out that he's talking about the old law, observing circumcision. He says, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, meaning of circumcision, of the old law. The same point he's making in Romans, where he says that it's by the faith and religion of Christ, not by the old law. That's he saying the same thing here. That screams out from the context. And so he's not saying that it, it doesn't involve any human works or any human deeds. So that that's abundantly obvious. And that's the difference, that the passages you bring up, because they're not teaching what you're saying, have a very reasonable answer. And the answer I just gave, it's people, if they're being honest, you can see that it makes sense because it's right in the context there. But the passages that I'm citing, there's no answer for them because they're directly teaching that men can lose their salvation, that sins are involved with salvation. If you live after the flesh, you shall die, okay, that people can believe and fall away. And so it's just to be dishonest not to accept it. But um, we could continue some more, or if you want to make a closing statement or 
Yeah, I was going to say because there, you know, we could go yeah. back and forth, you know, all night and everything. It's been two hours. It's been great, but um, the uh, no, we perhaps should wrap it up. Um, there are other issues I think where it's, uh, like I said, the position on this one. I don't think it's, it's crazy at all. I think it's. I don't believe it, but I can understand uh, pretty much why someone would and everything. Uh, but there are other issues I think that are more clearly uh, out out of touch with with uh, scripture and you know like the the one true church the soul scripture and everything i'd like to get into those sometime um, but yeah in, in summary i'd just like to say that there are so many statements in scripture that uh appear to offer believers assurance saying that they have been they have been sealed they have been called they are not in darkness the children of the light and of the day and that First Thessalonians 5, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. It seems to be a pretty comforting scripture. And uh, it says to comfort yourselves with these words. And um, there are a lot of them. It says, uh, you know, we're sealed, we're called, that uh, we're seated with him. Uh, we will uh, judge the world. We will judge angels, in fact, which is interesting because of the comparison between saints and angels that you've raised at other topics. Um, that uh, we have not attained, I think, the progressive justification uh, in Philippians 3. I think he's talking about that, where he says, I, I, don't, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press forward and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. I believe he's talking about uh, the, the extent of justification. We have not attained it isn't that I don't think he's talking about salvation. It's we haven't attained uh, perfection, nor will we in the, in the flesh. But we press forward toward the mark that when we see him, of course, we will be like him, uh, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, and he's oh, they're always talking about them, the things, the, the the wrath that comes upon the children of disobedience, their end is destruction, their God is their belly. Uh, but our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. I think uh, for the hope, uh, he talks about in Colossians 1, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven and exhorts everybody to walk worthy of the Lord, not that you're going to lose your salvation, but to be pleasing to him in all things. And again, this is an issue we can go around forever about. And uh, anyway, we know where each of us stands on that. And uh, there are other issues that are easier to get to the heart of, I think, but anyway, uh, we should probably, it's been two hours, it's been great, and I, I thank you so much for making the time, and, um... Yeah, do you I, mind if I, did, if, oh, if I just, with like two or three I minutes? Do, I do hope we can do it again soon. Of course, wrap up, I, obviously, take all the time you want. Okay, um, that, I would just say that, uh, there are clearly many passages we've covered, and there are is no explanation that anyone can give for the clear indications that people can be wa washed and then return to the mud, Second Peter 2. St. Paul clearly indicates in 1 Corinthians 9.27 he'd be among the reprobate. Ephesians 5, we clearly have those who are light in the Lord, the justified believers, can be partakers with the mortal sinners and excluded from salvation. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, indicating that certain sins exclude a person from salvation. We have the parables of Jesus you know, that those who do things with the talents he's received uh, will be saved. Those who do not do them will not be saved. Um, then we have other clear indications that he will render every man according to his works. Matthew 16, 27, um, he shall cast into hell those who do iniquity, not just on the basis of whether you have believed. Second Corinthians 5, 9 to 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So salvation is based on what a person has done. Um, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Uh, we have John 8:51. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Not just believe. Matthew 6:14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. It's only if he forgives. Okay, it's not by faith alone. Uh, then we have, and just uh, I'll, real quick, I'll be done soon. Luke 12, 38 to 43, blessed is that servant um, whom his Lord shall find so doing. And he goes on in Luke 21, he says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. 
okay, and take heed that drunkenness and the cares of this life don't under overtake you. So obviously it's whether you do these things that you will be saved. And so there are other passages we could discuss, but every passage that the other side brings up is, is easily answered. It's either referring to the old law um, or something in that context or another um, topic that is not dealing with what they think it is. And that's why there's a reasonable explanation for them, but there are no explanations for all of these clear indications in Scripture. So um, I guess that wraps it up, and we might be able to have another discussion on another topic, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I, I was just going to stop. Do you, do you mind if I just stop the recording now? Um, well, I can't. Uh, well, I was gonna. Well, I'll, I don't know. I don't know if I'll make videos. That is because it'd be so many. Um, I just want to say one thing that yeah, I do hope for those listeners. I, I do hope there are other uh, discussions that will follow because proving uh, this point, if if the Catholic position on this point were proven to be true, that doesn't prove the Catholic. And to be what the Catholic Church claims to be, it would have to be right about everything, 100% right about everything, which uh, I think will be demonstrated more clearly in the future that uh, that isn't uh, the case, and that's what we'll get to at another time. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I don't agree, but, uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't be here if you didn't. <laughs> right. So, um, okay, is, it, is there anything else, or I was just going to stop no, it? No, no, go ahead. Okay.